Hello to my friends joining us via recording. Today we're going to keep working on lesson number four. To help us get ready to talk about lesson number four, we just came from groups where we were working on remembering what our proteins, um, what statements would apply to these different types of transport proteins. So uh, for my friends in group one, I want you guys, somebody in your group, to do me a favor and, and tell me which, or type in here on my slide, which type of these, these proteins listed up at the top did we say were always open? If you want to type it on the slide for me, which kind of transport proteins are always open? Yeah, so uh, group number one is right. We, we landed on it. When we talk about leakage channel proteins, the analogy that I gave you guys for those ones is think about a leaky faucet. It's always leaking. So it's drip, drip, dripping very slowly, but it's always open. So leakage channel, always open. Group two, go ahead and type on the slide for me. What is the type of protein that attaches to what it's transporting? What kind of protein attaches? to what it transports. There we go, yep. Answer popped up there for us. It's those carrier proteins that attach to, to what they're, they're transporting. Here, I'll type it below. It's so tough, right, when you can't see what your friends are typing. So carrier proteins, this is the type of protein, remember we looked at the picture where it, oh, it's open on the outside, it attaches to something outside the cell, then it closes and it opens toward the inside and lets that thing out. So carrier proteins <clears throat> are the only kind of transport protein that attach to, to transporting. Uh, otherwise, if I had, had a category that said I don't attach to what I transport, that would have actually been every kind of channel protein that we have listed. Remember that channel proteins just make a channel. They, they just make a passageway for things to go through. Um, so they never attach to what they're transporting. Only carrier proteins do that attachment. Uh, let me mix it up a little bit. I'm gonna have group two help me out again with this one. Which kind of protein gets pushed open? When it gets pushed into a new shape, then it's open, then it can transport things. Yeah, absolutely. That's the definition for my mechanically gated channels. I told you uh, in the guided lesson to think about mechanically gated channels like a typical gate that you'd have on a fence. So mechanically gated channels, something physically changes its shape and pushes it open. We won't talk a lot about mechanically how we get to special senses. When we talk about the special senses of hearing and balance, we're gonna see a lot of these mechanically gated channels where something like sound waves presses on them and that causes them to open so you can hear. So there's a little teaser for us, those mechanically gated. All right, group one, bouncing back to you guys. When we talk about neurotransmitters opening us up, what kind of channel did we decide that one was? Yeah, absolutely. Neurotransmitters are an example of a chemical. So we have types of channels called chemically gated channels. I need some kind of chemical key to open them up. The most common one, the one that we're gonna see with neurons, uh, is, is neurotransmitters. That's my chemical key to open up these chemically gated channels. If I don't have that key, those channels are gonna stay closed and they're, they're not gonna transport anything. Let's back to group two. Uh, group two, help me out here. Which kind of channel opens when the charge changes? Yeah, so when, when you see this word charge, we should relate that to voltage. Voltage is a physics idea. So the, the amount of charge, when that changes, uh, that causes voltage-gated channels to open. I had a friend yesterday, I apologize, I, I can't remember who it was, we were talking about voltage-gated channels, and she used the analogy of a thermostat, um, how when your, your air isn't constantly running in your house, theoretically, <laughs> um, how if it gets a little too hot in your house, we get a, a degree or two above normal, your thermostat will detect that. 
or in the winter time, if it gets a degree or two below what you set it's set to, that'll cause the heater to kick on. I thought that was a great analogy for these voltage gated channels. If our charge gets a little bit too high or our charge gets a little bit too low, that's gonna cause these channels to open up. It's gonna cause them to start transporting things. The goal of these voltage gated channels is to change the charge some more, either to get back to normal or to take it all the way away from normal. So uh, I really liked that analogy of, of your thermostat. It's not always it's it's not always causing your your AC to be running, but it will detect when things change. When they change, that causes these channels to open or causes the the AC to kick on. When we talk about passive transport, to help us answer this last question here, my, my first question that I want you to help me with in the chat, transport, what does that mean? What happens in passive transport? Oh, somebody says I cut out. Uh, so the, the, the question is what happens in passive transport? Hannah gave us one of the ideas with passive transport. That first idea is that there's no energy required. Absolutely. Yep, and the only way there can be no energy required is we have to go from high concentration to low concentration. Yeah, Christina used one of the words we're gonna talk about today. That word is concentration gradient. So we're going from a place where I've got a lot of something high to where I've got a little of something. I'm going. So passive transport here, I'll put some notes for ourselves to help us remember. Passive transport means we go from high to low. And passive transport means no energy, no energy. Does anyone happen to remember? I think it was on um, maybe one of the last slides we talked about yesterday. We did actually kind of answer this question yesterday. Does anyone happen to remember um, when I told you we were doing facilitated diffusion? Does anyone remember what kind of Or anyone have a guess? Ah, says I'm cutting out. Okay, let me let me mess with my internet here. Is that better? Am I back? Ah, can we hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I played with my internet a little bit. Hopefully it will be better. No more cutting out. Uh, my question is, does anyone have a guess on uh, which of these kinds of proteins that I see listed up here do facilitated diffusion? Because that's what our question is getting at here. Passive transport is basically asking who does facilitated diffusion? Yeah, so, so Jacqueline is hesitant, but she's correct. All of my types of channel proteins do facilitated diffusion. So all channel proteins do facilitated diffusion, which means we take things high concentration to low concentration, which means we don't need energy, all of my channel proteins work that way. Whether they are a leakage channel that's always open, or whether there's some kind of gated channel that needs help getting open. Anytime we talk about a channel protein, it can only take things from where there's a high concentration to where there's a low concentration. That's one of those, I like to call them an underlying highlight star idea. Um, when we talk about channel proteins, you need to know that channel proteins can only ever move stuff from where there's a lot of it to where there's a little of it. Channel proteins only ever do passive transport. Carrier proteins can do both. Um, so carrier proteins can do passive transport if they're moving stuff from one side where there's a lot of it 
to the other side where there's not as much of it. But carrier proteins are, are also um, do all of the kinds of active transport that we Um, so Jacqueline asked, that's only the case when it comes to this lesson. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by your question. When we talk about the way that, that cells function in general, <laughs> she says she doesn't know either. That, it's, it's all good. Um, when we talk about these channel proteins in, in general, though, we're, we're actually going to see these proteins pop up all over the place when we're talking about how neurons work, um, we're going to see channel proteins all over the place. Channel proteins, regardless of where they're found, are always doing passive transport. So that, that's the big idea. Uh, and yeah, Nicole said, I, I'm still having some issues with my connection. <clears throat> yes, carrier proteins can do both active transport and passive transport. That is correct. Sorry, my internet's so funky today. Let me, let's see. Well, it says I'm plugged in, so I, I hesitate to try to mess with it anymore. <laughs> Hopefully it stays better for us. So these kind of statements, you're gonna see similar stuff on the homework assignment. Hopefully reviewing things like this helps you to get a bit of a, a good comparison in your mind between the different kinds of, of proteins that we use to transport stuff. Hey, by the way, uh, you can help me out in the chat what are the, to use our word, biochemical properties, or what kind of descriptor words would you use to describe the kinds of things that get into or out of the cell using a transport protein? What are some of the things that I have to use a transport protein for? Yeah, so one of those things is if it's polar, right? If it has dipoles, that's what polar means. Any other ideas? What's that word that means the same thing as polar? Yep, that, that word that means the same thing as hydrophilic. Yesterday we also used that terminology of um, water soluble. So all of those are things that, that mean the same thing. Hydrophilic. Uh, polar, water soluble, all of that's the same. That's the kind of stuff that, that we have to use a transport protein for. Can someone help me out in the chat? You have this picture in your an outline. Where or which page do we find this picture on? Okay, page four. So uh, we're going to pick up here on page four of your lesson outline. And we're, we're talking about something that, that we mentioned earlier, somebody mentioned in the chat for me, called the concentration gradient. Concentration gradient. The concentration gradient is the, the slope that shows me the difference between uh, two different concentrations. So a place that has a lot of something, a high concentration, and a place that has a low concentration, a, a difference. When I compare um, how different those things are to each other, that gives me a slope. So when I've got a lot of something, that, that's up high. When I have a little of something, it's down low. Whether that something is, um, I don't know, I guess we'll call this oxygen molecules over here, um, or whether what we're looking at right here is, is water or some kind of polar, uh, substance, for example, like glucose. It doesn't matter. Whenever I compare two solutions to each other, when I when I make that comparison, I have a slope that shows me their difference. So that slope is the concentration gradient. Hey, these these words. Um, yeah. So Nicole asked if we're comparing the same solution. We're actually comparing two different solutions here. And I was actually going to ask you, and I'm still going to ask you to help me out with my tonic words. In the chat, help me out. When I talk about something that has a high concentration, a higher concentration, what's the tonic word that I use? Blank tonic for a high concentration. Yeah, Hannah's correct. 
a high concentration, there we go, lots of us voting in here. High concentration is called hypertonic, meaning about too much or, or more of something. So my other side of the picture then, what would be the, the tonic word I'd use for my low concentration? What's going on on the other side? Yep, when I mean low concentration, it's hypotonic. Absolutely. So when I talk about the concentration gradient, the I'm basically talking about how steep is my slope between the hypertonic solution and the hypotonic solution. Whenever we're doing passive transport, passive transport, which you guys told me on the previous, uh, previous slide, we go from high concentration to low concentration. <clears throat> Whenever I'm doing a kind of passive I'm always going down my slope. So we're going, we're taking something that I have a lot of in one place and I'm moving it to where I don't have as much of it. Passive transport goes down the concentration gradient. Notice that we have two examples of passive transport in our image here. The first is diffusion. The second is osmosis. When we talk about diffusion and osmosis, they're both passive, meaning they both take stuff from high concentration to low concentration. What makes these two processes different from each other? How is diffusion different from osmosis? Okay. So um, yeah, the, the, simple, the simple answer is basically what moves, right? When we talk about diffusion, what moves in diffusion are those things we technically call solutes, right? Or the, the molecules, the dissolved things. Osmosis, the only thing that, that moves in osmosis is water. So when I look at osmosis, I am moving water molecules from where there's a whole lot of water down to where there's not as much water. When I talk about diffusion, I'm moving uh, those things that are dissolved in it, so salt, from where there's a lot of salt to where there's not as much salt. So passive transport, whether we're doing diffusion or whether we're doing osmosis, we always go down this slope. We're going from where there's a lot to where there's a little. When we talk about active transport, we're actually going up the slope, going up the slope. So when I go up the slope, that means I'm taking something that I don't have a lot of already on one side of the membrane, and I'm moving it to the side of the membrane where there's already a lot of it. So a good example of this that we're going to talk about here in just a moment is, is how a cell works with glucose, how a cell works with that kind of sugar. Hey, can anyone remind me in the chat, why do cells like glucose? What does glucose do for a cell? Yeah, glucose is a cell's favorite food. It's what it breaks down to make energy, yeah, to build that ATP, absolutely. So <clears throat> when we look at the way that cells get their glucose, how they get their food, they take any sugar that's outside the cell into the cell where there's already comparatively a lot of it because it wants that sugar so it can break it down to make energy out of it. So a cell is going to take something from where there's not a lot of it to where there's already a lot of it. That's active transport. Hey, remind me again, uh, when we do active transport, active transport does or does not require energy. Active transport does or does not require energy. Yeah, active transport does require energy. Okay, here's something I want you to, to write down in your notes. Underline, highlight, star it. Here we go. Um, when a cell spends energy, 
to do something, to do something. So in this case, to transport something. It must be important. Here's our, our statement. You can see it there at the bottom. When a cell spends energy to do something, that something must be important. It's got to be worth it for the cell to be willing to spend their energy to make this happen. Now, I, I usually use the analogy in class of you have money, and when you spend your money, theoretically, you're spending it on something that's important. But then I realized, thinking about my own life, especially my own life in, in lockdown right now, I'm like, you know, I, I'm spending money on some things that aren't quite so important, but I just want them. But I mean, I guess that's fair, right? I, I want them. Um, that that's how my daughter has gotten several of the toys that we've tried unsuccessfully to get her to be a little more independent playing with. <laughs> so we, we, we spend some of our energy money um, or we're spending our money on something that that theoretically is important. Um, so so think about when when you're thinking about active transport, cells are willing to spend money, their energy money to transport something from outside the cell where there's not a lot of it to inside the cell where there's already a lot of it, it must be important to that cell for it to be willing to use its own energy to do that. So active transport is just like when you spend your money. While we may not all be as smart as maybe we should be with how we spend our money, um, cells are very smart about how they spend their energy money. So yeah, like Isabel, think of it like money. That, that's a great way to think about it. So again, underline, highlight, star statement. When a cell spends energy to do something, it must be important. If a cell's willing to spend their energy on it, they must need it to survive. Yeah, and so, so Jacqueline uh, put in the chat and she's absolutely correct. It requires energy. It's gonna take us energy to do this because we're taking it from a place where there's not very much to a place where there's already a bunch. We're literally, when we talk about this concentration gradient like a hill, we're literally going uphill. So a place where there's not a lot to a place where there is a lot, we're pushing things up the hill. That's why it takes energy, absolutely. So 100% correct. We're going uphill instead of downhill. <clears throat> that is why it is active transport. And that's actually a really good tie in to, we'll come back to that picture there. <clears throat> what I wanna do with you first, before we go back to some of those other things, is I wanna do the analogy that, that literally is uphill downhill with you guys. So this is the analogy of boulders on, on a hill. Uh, you guys have this in your notes packet. What page is, is that analogy on where I made you guys do some drawing? Okay, page five. So <clears throat> this was already challenging for me to draw in class. We're gonna to try to draw it on the computer. This is gonna be awesome. So here we go. I guess that's not too bad so far, right? Okay. Um, so the boulders on a hill analogy, the goal of this is to help you get an idea of, of the way we can. Yeah, Hannah's like, you drew penguins, you got this. Yeah, we'll, we'll try, hopefully. <clears throat> okay, so, so here's the story. We're living in the time of social distancing, right? So there's not a lot of fun vacations that we can do. But we could go to the middle of nowhere um, and try to go hiking, hopefully in the fall, not in the Texas summer. So say you are, are hiking in, in fall in Texas, which will never come, right? So you're hiking and you stumble upon a rock. You're in the valley. We'll, we'll pretend that you're a little penguin here, I guess. We'll draw a little penguin that is you. You are walking along. You find the valley. <clears throat> and you look around and you say, hey, look, that boulder came from up here, up on the left. That's where this boulder came from. You recognize that for the boulder to go from the top of the hill up here to the bottom of your valley down here, that's an example of passive transport. Passive transport. It did not take energy, so let's put that on here, passive transport. Sorry, caps lock was on, try again. Okay, 
passive transport. It doesn't take energy for the rock that's at the top of the hill to go down the hill, down into the valley. Gravity does the work for us. This rock naturally wants to roll down. So no energy required for the rock to go from the top of the hill, where there's a bunch of them, to the bottom of the hill, where there's not a lot of them. But you decide that this poor rock here at the bottom of the hill, it looks really lonely. It, it's used to being around all of these boulders up here at, at the top of the hill. It's used to being with friends. So you decide that you're going to be the good Samaritan for this rock here, and you are going to get that, that boulder back to the top of the hill. So the way you're gonna get it to the top of the hill, the first way, we're gonna really gonna push it up the hill. If we work really hard, as, as our little penguin friend there, if my little penguin friend works really hard and he uses his own energy to physically push that boulder up the hill, which kind of tort is, is that representing? If I use my own energy to push that rock up the hill, what's going on there? Okay, so it is active transport. Yep, it's an example of active transport. Um, for any of my friends who've happened to look at, at the, um, the guided lesson, there's two kinds, primary active transport and secondary active transport. Yeah, so a couple, couple of us are, are chiming in in the chat. There's a special kind called primary active transport. Primary active transport. Here's the note that I'll add for you because we're gonna talk about this more in just a minute. In primary active transport, we're using the energy of ATP. Using the energy of ATP. When this penguin physically pushes this rock up the hill, pushes it all the way up there, it's using its own energy. It's using ATP that it's built in its muscle cells to push that rock up the hill. That's the first way that we can get that rock back up the hill. We can use our own energy, we can work really hard and push that rock up the hill. That's an example of primary active transport. By the way, here's just a, a clarifying note we'll put up here. Um, help me out with when I, I define these two things. Passive transport, remind me, does or does not take energy? Does passive transport take energy? Passive transport. It does not. Yep, no energy required. Passive transport, no energy. Anytime I talk about active transport, I do need energy. Energy is required. Getting that rock from down where there's a low concentration or down where gravity is, is pulling it down to back up where it's up the hill or where there's a higher concentration, that's always going to take energy. When we're talking about the types of energy that are possible, uh, there are a couple of different kinds that are possible. So the first kind of energy that could be used is ATP, or the, the first kind of energy that could be used is, is the chemical energy that a cell has. Nicole asked in the chat if the ATP comes from mitochondria. Can my friends help me out? Does ATP come from the mitochondria? It does, yep. Yeah, that's the job of, of the mitochondria is to make the ATP. That's why in, in high school or middle school, they, they probably told you that um, mitochondria was the powerhouse of the cell, right? ATP is our power, it's our energy. So um, yes, glad we're, we're on the right track. The energy for primary active transport came from the mitochondria, they made ATP. Now, if this poor penguin pushed this boulder all the way up the hill, it would be exhausted. That takes a lot of energy. But our penguin is, is smart. Our penguin notices that this, uh, this area that they're hiking in is actually a valley. And, and so on the other side of the valley, I've got a bunch of boulders up here too. And our penguin says, you know, if I could somehow get one of these boulders to knock into this one, it might push it up the hill. 
So I still want to get that boulder back up to the top. My goal is still to take that boulder back to this side of, of my valley here. But the way that I could do that is by using the energy of one of these boulders rolling down to bump into this one and push it up. The energy uh, of that is this, is, this is how I get energy for what we call secondary active transport. When we talk about secondary active transport, that means that my energy comes from something else going down its concentration gradient. In secondary active transport, I'm not using ATP. I'm using the energy that's released when something goes down its concentration gradient. When something goes from where there's a high concentration to where there's a low concentration. When that rock rolls down the hill, it's rolling fast, it can roll and transfer that to the rock here and bump it up the hill. So here's, here's a, the idea. When this rock rolls down the hill, when I roll one of these boulders from up here where there's a lot of them up high, and I roll it down into the valley where it bumps into my rock right here, notice how I color coded that blue? This, this rock up here rolling down the hill, that takes no energy. That, that rock wants to do that normally. So this actually is passive transport, no energy required. It wants to roll its own way, but because it releases energy, it's got energy that's rolling it down the hill, it actually shares that energy. And in your guided lesson, you got a picture that shows a big collision right here, right? That rolling boulder that has energy where it's moving, it bumps into this one right here, and when it bumps into this one right here, that pushes it up the hill. It's got up the hill, not because my penguin used its own energy to push it up the hill, but because the energy that came from this one going down its concentration gradient helped this molecule to go up its concentration gradient. So here's, here's our big ideas. First big idea. Difference between passive and active transport. In passive transport, no energy required. This will happen all on its own. In active transport, it is going to require energy. We're going from where there's a low concentration to where there's a high concentration. Or you can even think of this, like our example shows us, in, in terms of, of gravity, where we're down lower and something needs to go up higher. That's going to take energy. That's active transport. So first idea, which we already know, is the difference between these two things. Second idea is when I need energy, there's two different kinds. That energy can either come from my, my chemical energy, we call it, or my ATP, energy monies, or it can come from something else that's doing what it normally wants to do. When something goes down its concentration gradient, that requires no energy, that releases energy and I can steal that energy to power me to roll up the hill. Primary active transport, secondary active transport. That's the other big idea with, with these processes. Help me out in the chat. What questions do we still have at this point? Or shoot me a thumbs up if we're feeling okay about this. Okay, so there's a question. So secondary act want to use uh, another one's energy. Yes, uh, for secondary active transport to happen, we always have something else that's being transported as well. And that something else that's being transported is going down its concentration gradient. It's going down the slope. That will be the energy that pushes the other thing up its slope. So yes, in secondary active transport, there's always gonna be two things moving. 
goes up, one goes down. Got a couple of thumbs ups. I'll make my contribution. Nicole has a question for it. I, I didn't know how to type this. Um, so the in the diagram, the boulders on the right hand side, it comes down, which is passive. Does it then go back? Does it go up the other side or does it stay down in the middle? So um, if we're talking about in a cell, um, that's where this analogy is a little bit dicey in a cell because usually what happens is both of these molecules are, are transporting together across a membrane. Um, if we were to do this experiment in real life, what would happen is all of the energy that comes from this boulder rolling down the hill, it would give all of it to this boulder down here, push this one up the hill, and this one would just get stuck down here. Uh, in, in real life, because we'll, I'll show you here in just a moment, we have this thing called the sodium glucose co-transporter. In real life with my cell, the kinds of things that, that we're talking about doing this, um, they would both cross the membrane at the same time. So they both end up in the same place, basically. But again, if we were to do this experiment in real life, if you've ever seen one of those, um, there's those things that you can put on your desk where you, you pull the one of the balls out to the side and it knocks into the balls next to it and then the one on the other side bounces out and it kind of goes back and forth and it clicks. I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about. Okay, at least Isabel knows what I'm talking about here. Um, so it, it's one of those little things that like you can play with and, and mess with on your desk and then it's going click, 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 click uh, because the balls are moving back and forth. When one of them hits the side, it, it stays down here and causes this one to go up. Well, then imagine if we don't get enough energy, this one gets halfway up the hill and it comes back down and hits the rock again and it'll go halfway up the hill and it'll just keep going back and forth and back and forth. That That's, uh, yeah, so so inertia plays into it, yeah. Um, and that's where, again, this, this boulders analogy breaks down a little bit. Um, it, it doesn't match 100% to how things work in the cell, um, but it but it gives us an idea that I've got some energy here that I can use to power this thing to move. Oh yeah, I think you're right, Hannah. I think that's what it's called, Newton's Cradle, possibly. That sounds right. Um, here, your teacher's gonna do a quick Google search and we're, we're gonna see. Yes, yeah, so if you're, if you're interested in, uh, <laughs> uh, if you're interested in seeing what, what I'm talking about and doing a terrible job describing, uh, if you do a, a Google search for Newton's Cradle, um, it, it can be very soothing. Isabel says it's soothing. I, I agree. Nice little clicking that goes back and forth. So, uh, yeah, Newton's Cradle shows you what might actually happen in, in real life. <laughs> Hannah says she's going to buy one. That's that's awesome. I, I, I probably need one of those in my life. We, we all need something soothing, right? Nice little click back and forth. That That might do it. Or one of those little zen gardens, right? I should get one of those little tabletop zen gardens with a little tiny rake. Um, that seems like it could be, uh, could be soothing. <laughs> Actually, um, for the longest time in the spring when I was building all of the, the guided lessons for you guys that, that you work through, uh, I had zero time. Like I was, was not sleeping very much at all because I had to stay up and build all those lessons and stuff. So this semester they're built because I had students that worked through them in, in the summer. So I, I don't have to build things this semester. So I finally had just be enough time and just barely enough energy to pick up a quarantine hobby. Like way back in March when everyone, you know, had seen those Facebook posts that are right. Like if you don't develop a hobby or have a side hustle or anything, like you're wasting your quarantine. And like anyone with kids, uh, including me, was like, there's no way. Like kids in a job, you're like, no, there's, there's no side hobby. So I finally have just enough time to on occasion, like once every two to three nights, take a little bit of time to do a little bit of cross stitching. I'm becoming a little old lady here. Um, so I'm, I'm cross stitching something for my, my son's nursery, a little fox cross stitching thing. But I, I did a search on Pinterest and I found some really awesome ones that are brains and skulls and hearts. So once I finish making his fox and then I make a little, um, Lilo and Stitch thing for my daughter because that's her current obsession then I think I'm going to move on to doing like a cross section of the brain and it will probably kill me and it'll probably take me about five years but uh, 
that that's my quarantine hobby that I'm doing very, very slowly. <laughs> Any other quarantine hobbies? Hannah says she's done a lot of knitting. Yeah, cross stitching is really not too bad, Hannah. You could you could give it a try. Although I'm going to be honest, my eyes are starting to uh, to get old. It's it's sad for me to admit that my eyes are starting to get old. I don't normally think that I need to consider reading or like reading glasses, um, but it it might be getting getting time soon. <laughs> Tierney says shopping. Um, yeah, I, I feel you on that. Oh my gosh, Amazon. We're like Amazon's favorite uh, favorite consumer over here. Christina likes her Cricut machine. Yeah. That's awesome. I find myself cooking more too. Um, some of that's probably because I have to cook lunch and dinner. So we found some really awesome recipes <laughs> in the Instant Pot. We're, we're doing more with our Instant Pot. So if you don't have a quarantine hobby, I have no, uh, no disrespect for you at all because, oh my gosh, I, I wouldn't even really call my cross stitching a quarantine hobby because it's gonna take me forever to do anything. So don't feel bad if you're just studying all the time, right? That, that's what we're doing now is we're, we're studying anatomy all the time. <laughs> okay, I don't even know how we got on that, that sidetrack. So sorry. Um, yeah, Jacqueline's like, anatomy is my hobby. I, I feel you. Yep, I, I get that. <laughs> um, are we good on, on this particular analogy? Do we feel okay with this? Okay, a couple of us are saying yes. Um, what I'll say too is as I do describe this analogy again in the guided lesson. So if you wanna look at it again too, um, you can go through and you can see um, a description of, of each of these steps too. To show you, now that we've kind of talked about um, an analogy for them, now I want to, um, I wanna look at specific examples of the two kinds of transport so I want to start with looking at primary active transport, primary active transport. Uh, help me out in the chat. When I do primary active transport, where did we say the energy came from in primary active transport? Yeah, so primary active transport is when the energy comes from ATP. Energy comes from ATP. Um, remember, anytime you see active transport, active means energy is required. When I'm doing primary active transport, the place I get that energy, what primary tells me is that that energy came from ATP. So a good example of primary active transport when I use ATP as my energy source is something called the sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump. Hey, not a trick question. The sodium potassium pump, what is that going to move based on its name? The sodium potassium pump. Yeah, it, it's not a trick question, right? The sodium potassium pump moves sodium and it moves potassium, okay? That's the first thing we need to know about this pump. Pump is we need to know which direction things are moving. Again, not a trick question. When we look at our picture over here that, that shows us these processes, which direction is sodium moving? Is it going in? or out, where's sodium going? Yeah, so if we look at our little area arrow, sodium moves out of the cell. When I, I look at my little arrow here, so here's a sodium, right, Na+, plus, and it goes out of the cell. When we look at potassium, which way is potassium moving? Can we tell? Potassium, yep, moves into the cell. Potassium moves into the cell. Okay, the movement of sodium and potassium, the directions that they're going, require energy. I need you to help me out. We need to figure out why this requires energy. 
energy to move sodium into the cell, why does it take, or excuse me, move sodium out of the cell, why does it take energy to move potassium into the cell? Yeah, so a, a couple of us cautiously are, are mentioning our concentration gradients. And our concentration gradient is why this is going to, to take us extra energy. So um, I'll, I'll mention that a couple of us said the plasma membrane is going to block these things. Yes, we are correct that the plasma membrane blocks them. Can you help me out in the chat? Why can't sodium and potassium diffuse through? Why can't these things do? Do we know why? Yeah, they've got charges. Okay, so these things have charges. They can't diffuse through the membrane. But here's what I'll mention. Um, even though they have charges and they can't diffuse through the membrane, theoretically, they could move through the membrane using facilitated diffusion. Sodium and potassium could do facilitated diffusion. However, facilitated diffusion is passive transport, meaning they're going to go down their concentration gradient. When we talk about active transport, we're going up the concentration gradient. And I saw a note from, from Keenan in the chat, and th that this is an important reminder for us that we got to make sure we understand the salty banana, the salty banana. Anybody remember that? Let me draw it for us. Draw us a little banana over here. The salty banana that is representing our cell. When I talk about a banana, what ion, sodium, potassium, chloride, inside my cells or inside a banana? What do bananas have a lot of? Yeah, it's a long name, right? The abbreviation is much shorter. K plus, potassium. Bananas have a whole lot of potassium. Your cells have a whole lot of potassium on the inside. Remember, the banana we're learning, though, is a salty banana, a banana that I sprinkled salt on top of. The chemical formula for salt is Na plus sodium, and Cl minus chloride. I sprinkled salt on the outside of my banana. I've got a salty banana. That's what your cells are like. Lots of sodium and chloride on the outside, lots of potassium on the inside. Normal, normal for a cell. If I was doing facilitated diffusion, if things were going down their concentration gradient, which way does sodium want to move? If it's going from high concentration to low concentration, which way is sodium going? Yeah, if we are doing passive transport, if we're doing facilitated diffusion that goes down the concentration gradient, here, I'll, I'll make a little note for us up here. If I'm doing passive transport, that means that sodium, it goes into the cell. Sodium is going to go into the cell. Which way is potassium going to want to move? If I'm going from high concentration to low concentration, which way does would sodium want to want to go? Yeah, sodium is going to go out. Okay. If I was doing passive transport, if I was moving these things with no energy, sodium is going to go in, potassium is going to go out. Check out my description down here. Sodium is going out. Potassium. I have, let's start with potassium. I've got a lot of potassium inside my cell, not as much outside. And yet, what I have on the outside, I'm pushing it in. And let's do sodium. I have a lot of sodium on the outside, 
not as much on the inside, but what I have inside here, I'm pushing out. Both of these ions are going uphill. Both of them are going from where there's not a lot to where there's already to high. The reason I have to use energy for moving both of these ions is because they're both going up the concentration gradient. They're both going from low concentration to high concentration. So I'm gonna put a note here. Both ions move from low to high. The reason I need energy for these movements is they're going from where there's a low concentration to where there's a high concentration. That always takes energy. Hey, here's where I, I give you a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and I, I kind of mentioned it before, but we mentioned it again. We must know about our salty banana, 100%. You've just got to know that there's a lot of potassium inside and there's not a lot, or there's not a lot outside. There's a lot of sodium and chloride on the outside, not a lot on the inside. We've just got to know that because that's going to come up in every single unit. So please make sure you know those recipes is what I called them for our different types of fluid. Where do I have sodium? Where do I have chloride? Where do I have potassium? Where do I have proteins and glucose? Please make sure we know those recipes because I promise you there's going to be some questions on the test about that. Okay, primary active transport. To make primary active transport happen, I need to use ATP. My example of using a, a ATP as my energy source is the sodium potassium pump. Both of these ions moved from low to high. If I've got two things that are moving and they're both going against their concentration gradient, the only way I can make that happen is to use the energy of ATP, primary active transport. Let's look at secondary active transport. Secondary active transport. To help us understand where the energy of secondary active transport comes from, we're going to start with our example of what's called the sodium glucose cotransporter. Hey, the sodium glucose cotransporter is just like the sodium potassium pump. Its name tells us exactly what's moving, sodium and glucose. So this protein, it's called a co-transporter protein, it transports these two molecules at the same time. Let's use our picture here. Let's start with sodium. Which direction is sodium moving in the sodium glucose co-transporter? Can we tell? Which way does sodium go? Yeah, sodium moves into the cell, okay? And what about glucose? Can we tell which way the glucose is moving? Is glucose going in or going out? Which way is glucose going? Yeah, glucose is also moving in, moves into the cell. Glucose moves in. Here's where we need to think again about our salty banana. Let's draw ourselves another banana. Here comes that banana. Oh, this one looks real terrible. Okay, when we talked about a salty banana, where was the sodium? Inside or outside? Where's the sodium in my salty banana? Yeah, my sodium's on the outside. Sodium on the outside. Who can remember way back from lesson, I think it was lesson number two. Where is my glucose concentrated normally? Is there more inside or outside a cell? Yeah, there's more glucose inside. So I'm gonna type my glucose. There's more glucose inside the cell. Okay, so I'm gonna draw some arrows. Help me out with, with drawing my arrows here. If I were to do, let's, let's type up here at the top. If I were to do facilitated diffusion, 
with these two things, which remember it's diffusion. So it's passive transport. It's going from high concentration to low concentration with facilitated diffusion. Which way does sodium want to move? Is sodium going to want to go in or out if I do facilitated diffusion? Yeah, sodium wants to go in because there's a lot of it inside or outside, not as much inside. Sodium wants to go in. If I do facilitated diffusion with glucose, does glucose want to go in or out? Which way does glucose want to go? Any guesses? Glucose. Yeah, so a couple of us are questioning. If I do facilitated diffusion, I'm just transporting something from where there's a lot of it to where there's a little of it. So a couple of us have, have honed in. There's a lot of glucose inside the cell, right? Which means then that glucose wants to go out. If I spent no energy and I just used uh, channel proteins to move my sodium and to move my glucose, sodium would rush into the cell. Glucose would rush out of the cell. Now let's look at this. When we talked about our sodium, the way that the sodium was moving, sodium was going into the cell. Hey, sodium going into the cell, that would or would not require energy. Does it take energy to move sodium into the cell? We're really nervous about this question. Hey, check this out. Facilitated diffusion. Diffusion as in passive transport, no energy required. Sodium wants to go into the cell. If I can bring sodium in using diffusion, there's no energy required for that. Uh, I know a couple of us mentioned it has a charge. Just because it has a charge doesn't mean that we need energy to move it. It just means that we need a protein to move it. It means it can't go through the membrane on its own. But if I have the right protein to get the job in, I can totally move it in without energy. So facilitated diffusion, if, if we let this do its own thing, what would happen is sodium would go through a channel to get into the cell. Sodium wants to go in because there's a lot of it on the outside and not a lot of it on the inside. When I let sodium into the cell, no energy is required. Let's put a note next to that. Sodium moves in, no energy required. Sodium, there's a lot outside. I bring it in. When I bring it in, that doesn't take me energy. I, I'm seeing uh, more questions about, about that charge thing. When we, we talk about something that has a charge, something with a charge would be hydrophilic. It would play nice with water. So something with a charge, something that plays nice with water, we're going to have to use a protein to get it across the membrane. Because remember, these guys here in the middle, they don't play nice with water. If you play nice with water, we're going to kick you out, literally. Think about these little tails kind of like, like legs. They're kicking anything out that does not match them. So if you've got a positive charge, you play nice with water, you try to go next to these tails to sneak inside, they say, uh, oh, no, they'll kick you back out. Or you're on the inside, you've got a positive charge, you try to start sneaking out, these tails say, uh, oh, no, I'm going to kick you back in. So if I am water soluble, if I, if I play nice with water, something with a charge would do, I can't sneak across the membrane. I can't go straight through. I'm going to have to use a protein. I'm going to have to do facilitated diffusion because I have that facilitator protein that, that does things. It makes a channel for those positives to go through. So important idea.
charge, positive or negative, to get across the membrane, you need a protein tunnel because you can't go straight across. If you match these guys, if you're nonpolar, if you're hydrophobic, you don't need a tunnel. You can just go straight in and out. No tunnel required. But if you look different than these guys, you've got to have a protein tunnel. Sometimes that tunnel will transport you with no energy. What we're talking about right now is types of tunnels that do need energy. So in secondary active transport or primary active transport, we need energy to be able to use these particular proteins to get things across. Okay, so Isabel's asking about the sodium. Uh, let's, we'll get there. Um, really fast, I, I want us to answer our question right here. So we said that when sodium moves into the cell, no, if I move glucose into the cell, would energy be required for that? Getting glucose into the cell? Does that take energy? So we're questioning. Here's what we outlined for ourselves. Let's check out up here. <clears throat> we talked about up here, facilitated diffusion. No energy required for facilitated diffusion. In facilitated diffusion, things go from where there's a lot of them to where there's a little of them. We have a lot of glucose inside the cell and not a lot of glucose outside the cell. If I used no energy and I transported stuff down their concentration gradient, I go from where there's a lot of them inside the cell to where there's not as many outside the cell. When I transport glucose with no energy, if I use spend no energy and I just let it move where it wants to move, it wants to go from inside the cell where there's a lot to outside the cell where there's a little. Can anyone hear me? Yes, okay, so yeah, Isabel is gonna come back in, okay. So here's, uh, here's our idea here when we're talking about how glucose is going. Glucose is going into the cell. I already have a lot of glucose inside of here. I don't have as much glucose outside of here. I need to get my, my con so when I move things this way, when I'm taking something where there's not a lot to where there's already a lot, that is going to require energy. When I move glucose into the cell, energy is required. When I move glucose into the cell, because there's already a lot of it inside the cell, it is going to take me energy. In the chat, I need to know how we feel about these two statements right here. Not everything just these two statements right here. It doesn't take energy to move sodium in. It does take energy to move glucose in. Okay, we're, we're kind of dicey. We're doing the, the wishy-washy thing with our hands right here. This is why uh, I mentioned for you guys, we gotta know the salty banana this is why we have to know the salty banana because when we're talking about whether or not energy is is required to move things these directions you can figure that out based on where things are more concentrated more or less concentrated when i talk about glucose when i'm memorizing my recipe for for cytosol for the stuff inside the cell there's a lot of glucose in here there's a lot of potassium in here. There's a lot of proteins in here. When I talk about the direction that things would move without energy, they always go from where there's a lot to where there's a little. There's a lot of glucose inside. There's a lot of potassium inside. If I ever talk about things like glucose or potassium leaving the cell, 
that doesn't take any energy. I've got a lot of sodium and chloride on the outside. They want to go inside. That takes no energy. So if I talk about sodium going inside or chloride going inside, that's not going to take energy. When I talk about Okay, sorry about that. My internet died, but it is back now. Can we hear me again? Yes, okay, I stopped talking when uh, I noticed my little thing scrolling. So you didn't miss anything. <laughs> I stopped, like I said, I stopped talking. Um, he, here's, here's the big idea. We gotta know our salty banana. If things are moving from where there's a lot of them to where there's a little of them, it takes no energy. If they're moving from where there's already just a little bit to where there's already a lot, that is going to take energy. So when sodium moves into the cell, because there's already so much of it on the outside and so little on the inside, that's not gonna take me any energy. That's the example of, remember we talked about the boulders, this sodium going into the cell, that's that boulder from the other side. Oh. So sorry, my internet died again. <laughs> my internet's like, what are we doing? Okay, the, the sodium moving in, uh, moving into the cell, let me get my clicker back here. The sodium moving into the cell is uh, like that boulder from the right side of the hill that rolls down the hill. It didn't take us any energy. It's rolling down into the middle of the valley. It bumps into the glucose that's there in, in the middle of the valley. That glucose wants to go into the cell. It wants to go back up to the other side of the valley, but it needs energy to do that. Sodium's got energy because it's rushing down that hill into the valley. It gives that energy to glucose to push it up the hill. So the energy of the sodium glucose co-transporter actually comes from sodium entering the cell. Where does the energy come from? Sodium entering the cell. Because sodium wants to come in. Sodium uh, is dying to come in. There's so much sodium outside, so little inside. Sodium's going to rush into the cell. Think about glucose kind of piggybacking on it. So I've got this opening right here. See my opening on the left for the sodium? I've got a space next to it for the glucose. Sodium so badly wants to go from outside the cell to inside the cell, it doesn't even care that it's sharing its protein space with glucose. So sodium gets into its little spot to be transported. Glucose says, sweet, I see a little hole right here. Glucose and sodium are attached. That protein, this is a carrier protein, by the way, that protein changes its shape lets the sodium inside. The sodium is super jazzed about that because there was so much outside, so little inside. And that glucose that just happened to sneak inside was able to get in because there was that space. So a shared space, glucose piggybacks on sodium. Sodium really wants to get inside. So badly it's willing to let glucose sneak in with it. So the energy of secondary active transport 
the way that, that your guided lesson describes it, one molecule moves down its concentration gradient. That allows one molecule to move up its concentration gradient. One molecule moving down its concentration gradient means we go from high concentration to low concentration. No energy required for that. When the other thing goes up its concentration gradient, we're going from somewhere where there's not a lot to somewhere where there's already a lot. We do that piggybacking or we steal that energy to move my second thing up its concentration gradient. I'm so sorry that we had those internet issues. So help me to know what questions do we have because things got a little choppy in there. What questions do we have about secondary active transport? Nicole asked, would sodium leave the cell with glucose's energy? Um, so this is actually a, an excellent question. To get sodium out of the cell, we use that sodium potassium pump that we talked about previously. And remember, that was an example of primary active transport. So ATP was required for that. One of the things that we use, the energy that glucose allows us to make, one of the things we use that energy for is to pump those sodiums back outside. So yes, when I want to get sodium back out of the cell, I would use some of that energy that the cell makes with the glucose coming in. That's actually kind of the big picture of, of what's going on. One of the things that, that the lesson asks you about a little bit later when you're comparing and contrasting these two proteins to each other is what the purpose of the proteins is. So let's look at the, the purpose of this one right here because we've got it pulled up. This is the sodium glucose co-transporter. I told you earlier in class today that if a cell is willing to use energy to do something, it must be important. The energy that, that we're seeing right here is the energy of sodium rushing into the cell. Sodium should be and normally is more concentrated outside a cell. A cell wants to keep more sodium on the outside. However, it's willing to let sodium inside to also let glucose inside. Remind me uh, again, why is glucose good for a cell? Why is a cell willing to use this energy to get glucose inside? Yeah, so they can get food. So, so one of the questions later in your packet asks for the purpose of the sodium glucose co-transporter. This is how a cell gets, it, gets its food. How a cell gets its food. A cell is willing to bring in these sodiums into the cell, even though with, with primary active transport, it literally just it used ATP to get them back outside. It's willing to use energy because it's so important for it to get its food. So the overall job of the sodium glucose co-transporter is to help a cell get its food. Okay, I'm going to lose my text here. So hopefully you, you took your notes or snapped your picture because I'm gonna go back to my primary active transport. Okay, here we go to that other slide. When I talk about primary active transport, the goal or the purpose, purpose of primary active transport is to polarize the membrane. Polarize the membrane. I need you to help me out in the chat. What does this even mean? It's a word I keep, keep asking you about. What does it mean if a cell is polarized? Okay, we're thinking about something with charges. 
Let's expand on that. Nicole mentioned opposite charges. What else can we say about that? Yeah, so different charges inside versus outside. The purpose of the sodium potassium pump is to polarize the, the membrane. Like we mentioned in the chat, the inside is negative, has a negative charge. The outside appears to have a more positive charge. The inside of, of your cells, I, I don't make you learn a lot of numbers, but a number that I am gonna make you learn in my class this semester is, is the number for what the charge is inside the cell. Does anyone happen to know what that number is? Have we found that in the guided lesson yet? What's the normal charge? Uh, that's when things change, Nicole, we're close. Yeah, so normal charge is negative 70. When we bump up to negative 55, that is another important number that we'll have to learn. We'll talk about that one tomorrow. Uh, so the normal charge on the membrane of your cells is negative 70 millivolts. That's when, when my membrane is polarized. What it means is that inside it looks more negative than it looks outside. The way that I do that is by moving some of these ions. So putting a certain number of potassiums, putting a whole bunch of, or excuse me, a certain number of sodiums on the outside. When I put a whole bunch of sodiums on the outside, the outside looks more positive than the inside. Remember, we want the cell to be polarized. It has to be polarized or it's dead. So I need my cell to be polarized. I need it so badly, I'm willing to use the energy of ATP to make it happen. So I'm gonna spend my chemical energy to put sodium on the outside and to put potassium on the inside because it's so important to me. The goal of it is to make things different inside and outside. And remember, the movements of these two ions with this pump, they're both moving up their concentration gradients. There's already a lot of sodium out here. I move more sodium out here, that, that takes energy. There's already a lot of potassium on the inside. I put more potassium on the inside, that takes energy. So I have to use ATP to give me energy for the sodium potassium pump because both of my things that move are going from low concentration to high concentration. When I do the sodium glucose co-transporter, one of them is moving down its concentration gradient. One of them is moving up. That's why I don't have to spend ATP for it. So if both things go uphill, it's gonna take me energy. If one thing goes down and one thing goes up, I don't have to spend this ATP energy to, to make it happen. Yeah, so Nicole asked in the chat, the purpose of sodium potassium pump, Yes, it's to polarize the cell, to make the inside more negative uh, and than the outside. The purpose of the sodium glucose co-transporter is to feed the cell. That's how we get our food. It is past 11, so I'm probably going to wrap up our, our lesson, our teaching portion of today. Tomorrow, we are going to dive into how this applies to neurons, because I know that that graph can be tricky for us to understand. Um, the good news is we're gonna look at it this unit here at the beginning, and then we're gonna come back to it again in unit number three. So here at the beginning, we're going to learn how to use um, some of our terminology about gated proteins and passive and active transport. That's the purpose of the graph this time, and it will come back later. We'll understand it better at the end, I promise. So that's tomorrow. Make sure we wrap up lesson number four before uh, our class time tomorrow. Nicole asked if the sodium potassium pump uh, occurs in response to the sodium glucose co-transporter. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I need the sodium potassium pump um, is because of the sodium glucose co-transporter. The other reason I need it though is when we start talking about how neurons work, um, neurons really like to mess up where these ions are found. 
So when we start talking about changing the charge on the plasma membrane of a neuron, it starts at negative 70 and then a cell goes nuts and lets in so much sodium that it goes all the way up to positive 30. I have to then get that cell back to normal um, and I'll use the sodium potassium pump to help with that. So it has to do with the sodium glucose co-transporter, but it also has to do with um, just the way that a cell normally functions. It's, it's constantly doing this pump here to make sure things are always as different as they're supposed to be. Any other questions that we have today? Yeah, so Nicole, we're going to wrap up lesson number four and then maybe do a little bit of review. I'm planning to review more with you guys Monday morning. So the Monday morning session next week at 930 uh, will be a free for all. So bring any questions from the unit. Um, it, it might take us the whole class time tomorrow to wrap up lesson number four to make sure we really understand that graph. So we may do more of that review stuff on on Monday. But here's a plug for, for SI, for supplemental instruction. Um, maybe someone can help me out. Her session tomorrow is at noon, right? Am I getting my times right? So SI is um, supplemental instruction. We have someone who took uh, anatomy and physiology, a, a previous student who hosts review sessions, including tomorrow, uh, or not tomorrow, excuse me, Friday. I'm all mixed up on the days of the week, so sorry. <laughs> Friday, I think at noon, um, she's hosting a review session for, for the first exam. So my students say that these review sessions are super helpful. Um, you can access that through the start here area of our Blackboard site. If you click in there, there's something that says supplemental instruction or SI about your SI leader. Um, yeah, so tomorrow's class with us is at 930. We will wrap up lesson number four. Elise will host a review session on Friday. Um, and here, I'll, I'll check that time while I'm talking with you guys. Okay, Elise is also at, at 9.30. Okay, perfect. I'm glad that, that you checked for me. So tomorrow at 9.30, we're going to finish lesson number four. Friday at 9.30, Elise is going to host a review session to help you talk about all of, of or many of the different topics from unit number one. And then 9.30 on Monday of next week, I will do a review session with you as well. So we'll try to do a little bit of, of review in our class time tomorrow if we have time, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we don't get to review until Monday. So plan for 9.30 tomorrow and Friday. Hannah has a question. Go for it. A quick question about the um, extra credit. So after we do, so um, what was it called? Um, one of the assignments that was due from the article. Did you say we were able to get extra credit for doing another one of those? Yes, so uh, the assignment is called Current Events in Anatomy. Um, you, everyone is required to do one submission of, of that assignment. You have to do at least one. If you do two, so you read two different articles that are both tagged with a, a unit number one tag, if you do two submissions, the second submission is extra credit. So the primary way you're gonna earn extra credit in this class is by doing extra current events in anatomy assignments. So uh, that it shouldn't be a super hard assignment. You read an article, you summarize it, you find some specific facts from our class that it relates to, uh, and then you pose a question that, that you don't quite see the answer to in the assignment. If you do two of those, the second one is worth extra credit. They are both due. If you're, if you're planning to do extra credit for unit number one, it needs to be submitted by Sunday uh, at 11.59. So at, at the normal due date is when your extra credit the submission would be due as well. Yes, you're welcome, Hannah. That was a, a good clarifying question. Any other questions for now? Oh, yeah, Karina says she thought she had to do one of each. Yeah, no, you, you only have to do one. <laughs> um, so if you did one for, for each of the tags, I think there's only cells and tissues for, for your first, um, for the first one. So I'm glad we learned that on this one and not when we get to like unit number three where there's like five, 10 tags. 
yeah, so if you've done one for each of those tags, then you're done and you're ready to submit your assignments. So you're, you're all set. All right, well, I'm going to end the recording. Uh, I will stick around for a little bit for questions. Um, otherwise, I hope to see many of you again tomorrow morning at 930.